11 o'clock. All right, we're live. We are. Yeah. We are. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everyone. everyone. Good morning. Uh oh. <laughs> Good morning to everyone out there. Thank you so much for your time joining us today. Uh, we have a very, very important topic that we are covering abolishing American history until they get it right. And, um, you know, before we get started, we're going to start with a very powerful message. I went through about 10 Black Anthem, National Anthem songs yesterday, but this one gave me chills. So we're going to start it off with our Black National Anthem. Eric, you got that set up? Can I just ask one question before, yeah. and that is, Miss Lisa Ray, how much time do you have? I'm here with you guys. Okay, good. All right. We're going to be here till midnight, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, let me look. I reclaim my time. <laughs> okay. All right. Everybody hear it? See the screen? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I wanna take this time for everybody to just uh, take a moment to share the video. This is an important message we gotta get out to everybody about abolishing American history until they get it right. My name is Malika Gardner. I'm on the board of We Will. Some of you know me from Evanston Live TV locally here. And I am with Representative LaShawn Ford, who is leading this bill. Um, we've actually got two bills on the table and I have learned so much <laughs> from this man, so much from this man. Um, but why we're here today is based off of a conversation that took place back on March 4th of this year, before COVID. We had went to a hearing in Springfield and Representative Ford and myself uh, went before House Committee for Education and I had to testify um, fighting for black history, fighting that they, they teach pre-enslavement of black history uh, to our youth, because I truly believe for our black children, 
it will give them more self-worth, self-identity, um, self-value, and to all children, they will come to learn and understand who Black people are in this country, what we've contributed to this country. And what was interesting in that conversation with the seven people who voted against this bill, uh, they had said, well, if we do it for the Black community, then we're going to have to do it for everybody. And they gave an example, like the Puerto Ricans. The room grew very, very silent, very silent. It was very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. We couldn't believe that that was even being said. And Representative Ford said, well, you know what? Why not have everybody included? Why wouldn't you want to include everybody? So it got very, very intense in that meeting. And he brought up a very important point. He said, you know, pretty much this is a class action lawsuit waiting to happen because you're miseducating our children on American history. And it's very, very damaging. And he also said, do you want us to get to the point where we're saying we're gonna suspend American history until you get it right? Because as of right now, the textbooks show Caucasians as the heroes and the leaders. So imagine what that is doing to our children because their history in the textbooks is starting in shackles and chains and then others aren't even represented. The Native Americans, their true history isn't really told in the history books. We may get one or two pages out of the entire textbook. So that's why we are here today because Representative Ford is bound and determined that they get history right. And if they can't get it right, we need to end it and stop miseducating our children. So this next video uh, we're going to play gives you more of an understanding and a background into what it is that we're here for. And then we're going to introduce our amazing guests that we have here. And I'm so excited. We've got a powerful lineup. During this Black History Month, students around the nation are learning about icons of the civil rights movement. But beyond those lessons, a CBS News analysis, analysis rather, found some major problems in the way that students are being taught about some very important moments in American history. Our national correspondent, Jerika Duncan, has been looking into this. And so, Jerika, we've been promoting your story all morning long. I'm mm -hmm. very curious to find out what you all found out. We learned a lot. And what we found out is that how you learn about topics like slavery and the civil rights movement really depends on where you live and the textbooks you're using. And some of the textbooks we looked at, there's information that may surprise you. Is there a problem with how we teach American history oh, in this country? Yes. Renowned scholar Dr. Ibram X. Kendi can't believe what students are learning about America's past. We're viewing these texts closely. You know, now I can see why so many students get to college and, and they're like, why didn't we learn this in high school? Because it isn't in these texts. We asked Kendi, a CBS News contributor, to take a look at four textbooks used in public school classrooms. The first book, The American Pageant, is used to teach advanced placement history. The publisher of the book says more than 5 million students learn from it each year. We looked at the 16th edition of the book, published in 2016. So here on, on page 346, it says, in the deeper South, many free Blacks were mulattoes. The term mulatto is a racist slur mm -hmm. against biracial people. The book also includes this map, referring to enslaved Africans in 1775 as immigrants alongside the Dutch, the Scottish, and the German. To refer to them again as immigrants insinuates that they chose to come. The African people who almost totally were forced to come and certainly did not want to come to the United States in chains. Just to see if things have changed, we looked at the latest edition of the book published this year. The map is still there. The assignment asked students to put a price on slaves what and how students learn about history is different everywhere and sometimes problematic. The teacher, who is white, told them to write funny captions on images of freed slaves. There are reports the teacher made black students act as slaves. There is no national standard for what history is taught. Each state sets standards which outlines what students are expected to learn. CBS News took a look at the social studies standards for all 50 states and the District of Columbia. We found seven states do not directly mention slavery, and eight do not mention the civil rights movement, 
only two states mentioned white supremacy and 16 list states' rights as a cause of the Civil War, which Kendi says is a problem. This was the term that the Confederate states that later segregationists and even some slaveholders utilized to hide that they were really fighting for the rights of slaveholders. Kevin Ellis is the chair of the Texas State Board of Education. About 10% of the nation's students attend a Texas public school. In 2018, the state changed its standards to teach slavery as the central cause of the Civil War, but it still mentions states' rights. Should states' rights even be taught at all? So I think even when you look at states' rights, it focused around slavery. And so what, we, what we're doing now is just being clear that those states' rights that the South was fighting over was states' rights for them to have slavery. Kendi also took a look at this textbook, Texas History, which is adopted by the state to teach middle school social studies. It covers topics including slavery and the Civil War. This is a picture and the caption says, some U.S. settlers brought slaves to Texas to help work the fields and do chores. And, you know, I don't, I don't think we should describe uh, slave labor as chores. A few pages later, Kendi pointed out this image. The caption for this picture says, what characteristics of slave life does this image show? Does this depict slavery? If we were going to have a single picture that depicted slavery, it should be a picture that demonstrates terror and violence. We also asked Ellis what he thought about the picture. Well, I think one of the... You know, as we go through the, the, the struggles um, and the injustices that the slaves went through, I think the important thing is not to do what was done in earlier times and, and make it sound like they were better off here than they were back in their... But this picture, their, this um, picture doesn't look so bad. You know, there's no marks on anyone's body. And this is supposed to represent enslaved people. I think the, the point that's being made is the fact this was not a true representation of what slaves went through and the injustices that they went through. And, and I can't answer why that made it in that textbook. We have progressed in, in the past five years and 10 years and 20 years, and, and we still have more work to do. And I think this would be an example of that. The publisher of that Texas history book, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, told CBS News in a statement that it appreciates and values Dr. Kendi's analysis of the textbook, and they are making intentional changes to the content in future editions. Cengage, the publisher of the American Pageant, said the authors work strenuously to provide an accurate, fair, and engrossing account of American history, and they are always striving to improve. They note the newest edition makes corrections and includes firsthand accounts from African Americans of the time. So important to point out, though, that the publishers can make these changes, but it's up to the states to adopt them. You it's know, up, the it's, states can it's up to the states. And you know, it's funny because I talked to a, a girlfriend of mine. Her daughter's in high school. She just got an A in her U.S. history class, and I told her about the story. And she said, "We have to teach them. It's up to the parents." And I think there is sort of this unsaid thing, even especially in Black communities, mm -hmm. that you're going to learn it from your family and not necessarily rely on. Mm -hmm school to do it just because you look at these changes that they've made this is in the last five years yeah exactly. that's very recent it's well so it's true. the most alarming thing you said in that story was that there were seven states where seven slavery states. is not even mentioned or civil rights yeah. that's right. what i find so jaw dropping yeah. and i think when you're a kid you're reading the textbook it doesn't occur to you to challenge it right you need a story I, like this to let you know yes and it's also unfortunate i think many times in the black community not really knowing our history right i think that is a problem well if the schools problem. aren't teaching it sometimes it's hard to know it it's, it's very very difficult Hi, right, Trika. That was very informative. Thank you. Okay. Now, that was some powerful information. Actually, it was played in Springfield, and it woke some people up, some people that came to the hearing to testify against the bill, actually watched that video and ended up supporting, <laughs> supporting us. So... I know you all have a lot to say about what you just saw, but I first want to introduce everybody and I would love for Lisa Ray to kick it off with her thoughts on, on this video. But first, let me introduce Lisa Ray for those who have been living under a rock, uh, who don't know who she is. She is a woman that I am very, very proud of. Very, she inspires me. She's from Chicago. So I'm always rooting for our Chi-Town people. Um, 
Lisa Ray is an actress. Many of you know her from her movies. She was on the uh, sitcom, All of Us, uh, produced by Will Smith and Jada Pinkett. Um, she's been in a plethora of films. And not only is she a talented actress, what I, I think I love most about her is when she became the first, she became the first lady of Turks and Caicos. And it was what she did on that island that was so impressive to me. She, she brought a carnival, she brought the industry there. She um, was donating money to the arts for young girls. She had started a pageant for not beauty, but for young girls' self-esteem. Um, she had done a lot for education. She's the queen mother of Ghana in terms of education over there. And I reached out to a few of our um, celebrities coming out of Chicago and Lisa Ray uh, responded. She said, oh, this is, this, is, this is me, this is what I wanna do. And she's a mom, she's a grandmom, and she wants to you know, really help in the state of Illinois in terms of education. She's been helping around the world Turks and Caicos, Ghana. And so I, I love that she has given us her time today and looking forward to hopefully working with her more um, on this abolishing history until they get it right movement. And I appreciate her time. She's very busy. She's calling us early morning from LA. And um, so I wanted to make sure I gave this woman her props. She is a phenomenal, strong woman out of Chicago. Love her, Lisa Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Malika, what can I say after all of that, that great introduction? Um, you hit the nail right on the head. I've waited for a very long time to be able to use my platform, utilize my voice for something that I really believe in and that touches close to home. And when I say close to home, it's because I'm a mother and I'm a grandmother. And besides that, I'm a person that can raise my hand and say, I don't know at all. I'm a person that can raise my hand and say, I have questions. Teach me, show me, tell me how to do better. They say, when you know better, you do better. And that's on every level, on no matter what age you are. But here's another story that I remember when I was young. My mother used to always say, when I would be in the back seat, humming to the music, singing and popping my fingers and knowing all the lyrics. And she would look back and say, if you knew your schoolwork like you know that music, you know, you know better. Mm -hmm. And then I would say underneath my breath, yeah, if they put it to music, maybe I would. Mm -hmm. But bingo, bingo, because I said, was it that I felt like I was bored? Was it not interesting enough for me? Was it not given to me in a way in which I could relate? That's all it is. Education is about giving it to someone that they can interpret it the way in which you are giving it. Mm -hmm. We are molding our children because they're in school, think about it, they're in school more hours, they see the teacher more hours than they actually do us. From age, from preschool all the way up to college, those hours of schooling is crucial to their life because it's, it is that. So it is very important that we see who we are in the textbooks so that we can believe that we can achieve just like our counters. It's just like the fashion industry with magazines. When we see them on the magazines, we see a size two. We don't see us. We don't see a size 14. It's just now being celebrated, you know, being thicker than a snicker is what I call it. You know what I mean? Being juicy. But it wasn't before we couldn't relate to the to the two size two year uh two uh size two girl on the cover you know we could not and so now that's the same way as it is with education if we don't know what where we came from we don't know what we can achieve we don't know and so when i think about the things that i know because i i'll be the first one to say to you since blm i have learned more about black history than I have the entire time that I've been in school. Yeah. I did not know that. Of course, you know, the, the, the ones like the first um, open heart surgeon was black. Um, Thomas uh, Edison, he made the light bulb. However, the black man is who made the little mechanism to go inside to make it turn on. That's important because without the light bulb, without that little mechanism in the middle, we wouldn't have the light bulb. Mm 
So how close-minded are the people that we're dealing with? Um, and when I say close-minded, um, that's just some. Some just need to be educated about the process. Some just need to be calmed down to let them know we're, we're not um, uh, so angry that we don't want to change. We're just trying to get attention so we can tell you about this change. That's all. And because we have to use so many different methods, because it's so many more of them than it is of us, we're saying, hey, 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 don't erase us because we're here. And we come in so many different shades and hues of color till certainly our children need to see ourselves. You know, it gives you it gives you that sense of accomplishment, you know. And so for me, when I look at my brown skinned grandbaby that is not as light as I am or my mother or her, her mother, she's living in a house where she goes. She looked at my freckles and moles on my body the other day and she said, Gaga. You're turning brown, brown like me, is what she said. And then I said, oh, I said, you know, I love being brown. I said, but we're a different kind of color brown. And I had to tell her and let her know that she was beautiful because it's just now being celebrated. So if we don't celebrate it, then we're showing a different message ourselves. And so I want to be able to stand up and to use my position, use my platform and my voice to be able to build relationships, to be able to get out there and petition, to be able to get out there and educate people. And I want to be able to say that, hey, I nominate myself. And if all of us collectively can get more like-minded people together, then yes, we can march. Yes, we can petition. Yes, we can go on Capitol Hill. Yes, we can, because that within itself, that movement within itself is going to be able to show them that we fought in 2020 for them. And that also should be in the textbook. Mm -hmm. So I'm on, I'm on board all the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes. Uh, Representative Fuller. No, I would, I wanted to know if Lisa Ray would just um, kick off the five minute sort of discussion about what you saw in that video clip, a six minute video clip. I think that gives everyone a chance to um, kick in and introduce themselves and talk about shortly, briefly, what they saw. Because that's the, sort of the tone why we're here. And the one with uh, Miss Gale. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. I, I think even before that, you know, when we um, listen to the national anthem, uh, when it says, um, let us march on until victory is won. That's what we're doing. That's what we're starting, you know? And like I said, we're getting more people together um, when we watch the clip with Gail on there, um, it's, 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 it's funny that, you know, you had two white people and two black people there. And I think that's phenomenal because still we need them to be able to help tell our stories. And sometimes they don't know how we feel. And I have been miseducated as well. You know, I remember reading the, um, textbook of Malcolm X when I was in high school. Well, I, I wasn't into Malcolm X. I didn't know who he was. I just felt like they're giving us this black book to be able to read so we can stay busy. You know, there wasn't no preloom of what it was and how important it was to know the story. So I glanced through it just enough to get maybe a B in my, on my test and did not cue into how important it was or really why it was so separate. Why did I have to take black history and then I had history over here. Why was it different? Why wasn't it included in history, period? I understand when they say that if they do it for the African-Americans, they're gonna have to do it for the Puerto Ricans, the Latinos, the Mexicans, the Jews, the whatever. All of us have been through something, all of us. But America, we were bought here. We built this, we helped this we belong here as well but they're not trying to give us our due justice and when we say that it be, it's some people out there to go you haven't contributed anything to america yet right here on this level what we mean is our ancestors is what we mean as we collectively because there are people and so yeah we're the ones that sit and saying Oh, I couldn't be in slavery. That couldn't be me because I couldn't pick cotton because I, I would have told master. That, no, no, you would have done just what they were doing, trying to survive. 
because that was the way of life then. Just like Martin Luther King, that was the way of life then. But I often say, who do we have now? Who is going to be the voice of us now? And I think it starts right here with us because collectively at 9.30 in the morning here in LA, we're up discussing this saying, how can we lend a hand? When they were talking about the miseducation, that's exactly right. It, it also informs us, us as how, it, how we have to represent, how getting a bill passed is, is important as well because we can start the preliminary, but we need people to take it there as well. That's educating people as well. The process of that, what does it take? Because they can say to us, oh, we have so much more to, to conquer or bigger things to be, to accomplish. Yeah, but isn't everything important? Like when is the best time to start fighting about that? I think this is a great time to be able to bring some acknowledgement to it because yes, we are fighting right now. Yes, we've had things happen so we can use that to say, hey, 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 this is still going on right here, right now in 2020. I had no idea. I had no idea racism was as big now as it was back in the 60s when Martin Luther King was marching. I feel, and this is my opinion, not by any means you guys' opinion, but I feel that Trump just unveiled the truth. He was able to be able to give people their, their oath to be able to say, or their courage to be able to say, oh yeah, I've been feeling like that. So now it, it's not for us to get mad. Now it's for us to say, oh, I did not know that, that you were right next to me. I did not know that because we all need to know where our enemies are. We keep them close too. That's important. We learn from the, the enemy, but they have to also learn from us and we have to teach them in a way in which they're hearing us. It's not the looting, it's not the fighting, it's not any of that. It is intelligent people, human people, to be able to come to them to say, we're not standing for this any longer. Here's what's in black and white. Here's what's important. What's important is that we're all human. We should be created. We are created equal, but we should be treated equally as well. We want our children to be able to know about history, all of history. Right. I think that right there is what we need to push, push, push what American history needs to be. It needs to be just that American history of everybody included. And I'm not against that at all. I saw that as a mom, as a, as a former first lady, as a cousin, as an auntie, as an actress, as a grandmother, as a woman. I am going to be the voice of reasoning because I'm going to ask those questions that some people can say that are foolish questions or I'm too embarrassed to ask because I should have known. I'll take that heat. I'll be that one to say, what are those questions? And we need to open it up because everybody's voice needs to be heard because they need to feel like they are, are included in what it is that we are, are doing and that we're projecting here. And I think having someone that people identify with makes the language and the message relatable. When you use someone that already has a voice, people are wanting to listen, just like, uh, you know, as much as I hate to say it, just like Cardi B. You know, when she started talking about, um, 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 who was she uh, uh, representing? Uh, Sanders. She sat down with him. A lot of people didn't know that she had politics on the mind at all, but the move, was to say, let me bring all of my fan base to this conversation. So whatever comes out of this conversation, people can hear it. I may not know a lot about politics, but I can sit down and bring my fan base here so I can educate those and let and allow them to be able to hear. And that's what I want to do. And being a Chicago girl, like I said, I've been waiting for a very long time to be able to lend my voice to something that I believe in. So, you know, I do believe that now I got something, and 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 just so everyone know, um, Malika and I um, on social media is how we found each other. I ran across her page. The power of the 2020 social media, right, doggone it, right now, it is the way we didn't have this 20 years ago. 
You know what I mean? Now we can get messages out quick. It's the power of that. Well, then we have to now use every level in which we all have to be able to put together to let the message be known. So that's what I'd like to be. I'd like to be that person to allow that message to come through me as well and educate me as, as well, please. And thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa Ray. We're gonna, um, that was powerful. And I thank you so much for mm -hmm. answering your social media. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I did too. I am very glad. Um, the next person we want to ask your opinion on on the video is Dino Robinson. He's the founder of Shorefront Legacy Group. He's a historian. He's doing some amazing work here in Evanston. He understands the power in making sure our history is preserved because they are trying to get rid of it. And so when I talked to him about abolishment, he was like, I'm there, I'm there. So Dino, you there? Yes, yes I'm here. Thank yes. you so much. And uh, Lisa Ray, thank you for your words. Um, mm -hmm. I was sitting here reflecting back on my own history in, in education and in, 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 in schooling. I'm also a Chicago guy, came out of a uh, Roseland area. Moved to, my family moved to Glenview in 1972. I had the privilege or the challenge of integrating my elementary school. So if you can imagine at that time during the 70s, having to learn a history that did not include me, I do remember distinctly reading exactly one paragraph about our history. We were slaves and King freed us. That was pretty much it. Um, and it wasn't until about seventh grade, looking through the history books in class, and there was still teaching that Columbus discovered America. And my hand shot up and said, wait a minute, how is it that a person can find something where people already are there? Hello. <laughs> when the community was already there. The teacher told me to shut up. I challenged again. I said, I'm trying to learn history. And this history seems to be skewed. And I started looking through the chapter history of chapter titles, the expansion of the West. Or I started looking at it as the, um, the, the, the uh, child labor uh, in, in economy um, or, or the... Um, the slaughter of Native Americans in the United States. So I started looking at these chapter titles in a different light. And that's what inspired me. That was one of my early inspirations, what led me to find uh, this organization, Shorefront, which uh, that collects, preserves, and educates people about Black history on Chicago's suburban North Shore. Um, I believed in the power of communities controlling its narrative and providing the resources so that communities can research and control their own narrative and add themselves to the history. Um, before we existed, if you looked up anything about Blacks on the North Shore of Chicago, um, the dialogue would be, we were domestics and we went to church. Now we could say that we had a queen that came from Evanston. We had pioneers that changed um, politics in the United States, actors and actresses uh, that came out of Evanston. Um, and share that with our youth in the community so that they know that the community they grow up in, they live next door to somebody that may change, not only in their neighborhood, but across the nation and globally. And that's something you don't learn in schools. Um, you know, and for a long time, I was on the fence, is it, um, to, you know, think of, is it the school's responsibility to teach us about ourselves? It's, our history here in the United States is, I, I always kind of jokingly say, it's a beautiful mess. Um, and I say that because there are so many uh, contributions to what made the United, Base, um, United States what it is today. And if we don't tell the complete story, everyone's story, and how these states came to be, then we are really missing out on a larger picture. So when uh, Malika reached out and said, you know, this bill is important, of course, I said, yeah, of course it's important. Of course we have to do something about this. We have to rise up, we have to move on. We have to add to the curriculum. We have to make our voices heard. So that video that we saw about the textbooks, I was right there with that. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I saw. And it does need to change. And we have to affect that change. So thank you. And I'm privileged to be a part of this panel. Can I ask a question too? Um, where are we live from? I'd love to be able to share this with my um, uh, fan base Evanston. here for them to come. Can we? Can they hear us or see us? Lisa Ray, in, Lisa Ray, if you go into the chat section of the screen, you'll see the link to the Facebook page where you can then share it. 
and for those of you joining us, it's live on um, We Will's both group and We Will Nonprofits page. Um, mm -mm, I don't see it. I think I if you go, Alisa Ray, if you go into your Facebook page and put in there, uh, Malika, where do you want? Evanston. Evanston Live TV. Then you could share it from there. From Evanston Live TV. Uh -huh. Okay, got it. Okay, our next panelist, Dr. Michael Allen. He's a principal of Oakton Elementary here, uh, principal of the year, 2020 Cook County. Um, he spoke at our last press conference and, and he was very, very powerful. And he gave me a tour of the African-centered curriculum uh, program and at the school at Oakton. And it was pretty amazing. And so when I talked to him about abolishing history until they get it right, he was like, I'm there again, whatever you need. So Dr. Allen. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to, to spend this time with each of you. Definitely want to hold space for, for Lisa Ray, uh, Dino, Representative uh, Ford and Malika. Um, just grateful for your work and your efforts. Um, I think my question and my charge is to respond to the video itself. Um, so my, my perspective as a black cisgender uh, male um, is who, who considers, can you all hear me fine? Mm -hmm. yes. So I consider myself not just a principal, even though I've been a, an educator for the last 15 years, 13 of which a principal of some sort. Um, I consider myself an ambassador for marginalized groups, for people who don't have the opportunity to speak up for themselves, to be that voice at the table as, as Lisa Ray described. Um, and so for me, when I think about the video, but I also think about the context of what uh, Malika is pushing and what Representative Ford is pushing, um, it, it reminds me of two different things. Number one, um, Marcus Garvey um, had this quote that I stumbled into in the middle of college uh, when I wasn't quite connected to who I was supposed to be and my purpose uh, for my people. And when I say my people, I'm, think, I'm talking about black indigenous people of color and all marginalized groups is this idea that a people without knowledge of their past history, origin and culture is a people, is like a tree without roots. Um, and for me, I remember feeling like I had no root up until that point. Like I found safety only in math and science as a, as a student that was labeled gifted and talented I still didn't feel connected, that there was nothing really uniquely valuable around me as a person. And I think as I was able to move through life, I started to stumble into something that I would call true and authentic um, collectivism that's connected back to who we are. Um, and as a principal who has an African center program in my school, the way that I can see the light radiating in each of my students, the ability to see themselves in each other and to see a connection beyond just physical, technical things but some empowerment that trickles into to our households, into our community. So I think this, this bill and this movement and the impact on, on us um, kind of wraps up with my second quote that I think I stumbled into recently. It's from Shirley Trism. In the end, anti-Black, anti-female, and all forms of discrimination are equivalent to the same thing, anti-humanism. And so for me, everything I'm doing right now to speak for my platform is about I think this bill really, when we really talk about it, is about pro-humanity, the reality of having holistic education for all kids, recognizing that Black folks, um, Latinx folks, and, and all other marginalized groups have been left out for one purpose, um, to, to, to be anti-other. And I think it's time, and I applaud uh, Representative Ford and Malika for pushing this platform to be able to make sure we're clear. You know, we're all pro-humanity here. It's not just about trying to isolate other groups but everybody's voice needs to be heard. And I'm just grateful to be a part of this. And I think that is ultimately what, what the true purpose is long-term is. Everybody needs to be heard and we don't have to silence others in order to have our voices heard. And I think it's about time for that. So thank you all for being able to participate in this process. Um, hopefully I responded uh, appropriately to the question. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Allen, I, this is gonna be the only time that I ask someone to make a comment um, because I wanna move, I think we wanna move past this section of uh, discussing the clip, but you had a powerful statement at the press conference about how you felt in history classes as a Black 
uh, man at the time of black student. I think it would be very, very um, helpful if you share that story, how you felt in that classroom or those classrooms. Sure. I mean, um, you want me to share the piece I shared there or you want me to just give you a synopsis of, of what I I'm saying? Share what you feel. I mean, because I think it's very powerful and I remember it. Um, and I think everyone remembers it because, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that I would say if I had to describe my feeling, and again, let me be clear about this. I wasn't, I wasn't, I was a kid that made straight A's virtually all the way through school. So school was never hard for me. But the feeling I felt in history class, unlike math and science, was invisible. I never saw myself connected. Um, and so it, it's, it allowed me to spiral down this aimless path of, of not quite seeing the point of what it was that I was doing. So I felt if I use words and adjectives, as I should say, invisible, bamboozled, disconnected, um, unsure, unloved, unprotected. And I think what ultimately was hard for me over the course of, that, of my life was, I'm, I'm not sure what was rooting the ability to have hope. And I just think for me as, as a black man, um, it was a dangerous place to be. I'm just fortunate to have stumbled into mentors and people who invested in my gifts inside of uh, over the course of my life to be able to get me to a place to where, you know, I could be a person who comes from a household with two parents who battle drug addiction, dealing with homelessness, um, uh, not having lights, um, not having water at, at very early phases of my life and stumble into this place of being able to understand, okay, I come from greatness. My people are excellent and always have been that way. But for whatever reason, having that experience in history, I just didn't know that until I was an adult. And I think that was a disservice for me. Um, and the biggest thing, and I think probably the most um, uncomfortable feeling I've ever felt in my life, and I felt it for mo the first 19 years, was invisible. So that's how I would describe um, my journey in history in K-12 school. So grateful for what I was able to get in in college from people like uh, Reverend Dr. Gregory Jones, who, who was, uh, I would consider revolutionary, but really gave me a footing for knowing who I am, where I come from, and, and what's to come from me, and the expectation for that, that seemed to exist long before I was born. So thank you, Representative Ford. Thank you for that, Dr. Allen. And we have uh, Vanessa Alvarado. She's an educator. And I'm really interested in hearing her and I were uh, talking about abolishing history lessons. So from an educator's point of view, I would love to hear her perspective on that and her experience in not seeing her representation in our history lessons. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to the panel. Um, can you hear me fine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So um, thank you, Dr. Michael, Alan. Nice to see you again. Um, I was, you know, nodding my head to a lot of what you were saying. Um, I often do as a, you know, student and in history class felt, uh, or just in school in general, uh, felt invisible. Um, you know, just like rarely called on. Um, never really having any one-on-one -on -one with the, you know, the teacher or any like, I never really got to know any of the teachers. Um, and then in high school, you know, and I was a pretty good student. I really enjoyed school. I loved school. Um, and in the high school, it just felt, you know, as far as like feeling invisible um, and the history lessons that I was learning, um, you know, I can completely relate. I feel like they were, like we were being brainwashed in, in a sense, you know. Um, history lessons became so predictable and just so, um, you know, it, we were hearing the same things over and over in our history lessons. So yeah, I could get straight A's in history. It was the same kind of um, recycled um, heroes and representation, you know, white, um, you know, people, white people, Europeans were, you know, more the, the heroes and, and the people who really um, made this nation, this great nation. Um, fortunately, I had parents who tried to fill in a lot of those, you know, um, gaps and, and um, answer the questions that I had, um, you know, and, and during our first discussion, I mentioned that, you know, sitting in these lessons, I asked my father, you know, why is it, why aren't I hearing, you know, some of the things that you're telling me about um, Latinx, back then we would say, you know, Hispanics and why, you know, why aren't I being told about the true history of um, 
the minorities and women also in this, in, in my lessons. And my dad would just say, Vanessa, you know, we're there, people in power are trying to keep the status quo. And, you know, throughout my life, I've worked as an educator and I also worked in social services. Um, so for 30 years, you know, this has been my life. I've worked with, um, you know, marginalized people in my, my whole career. And, um, you know, I just feel like as far as an educator, you know, I have a tremendous responsibility to, you know, not teach those lessons. I've often, um, you know, and we have to teach to the standards, right? So trying to fit in standards, but then also like on my own, trying to supplement lessons that, you know, are culturally inclusive and highlighting people of color, but it's like, it's on me personally, right? It's not something that's been you know, done across the board. Not all teachers feel the same way I do. Not all teachers understand what I understand and how it affects kids of color, um, girls. Um, so I just wanted to point out one thing that maybe hasn't been brought up yet. Well, actually, um, Dr. Allen, you did mention that, um, you know, the tree without roots quotes. Um, I feel like lately when I've been trying to, you know, teach these culturally inclusive lessons to students, I'm finding that, um, you know, they're just, they're not really buying in. And I'm thinking, well, why aren't they wanting to learn about, you know, their culture or their ancestry? And I, and then when you mentioned, you know, a tree without roots, I'm like, yes, you know, if they're being taught if they see society does not value, you know, their people, they're not trying to identify with their people. So um, it's really sad. I, I really, my heart breaks when I see these kids, you know, first generation, maybe immigrants or even second or third, they are leaving like their culture behind and saying like, you know, the more I identify with that culture, you know, the more I'm going to be held back in this country. And I don't want, you know, and it's because of, you know, the history lessons, if they're seeing that, and because of today's society, if they're seeing that this culture is not valued and anyone that really, you know, identifies with this culture, you know, it could be actually used against them or it doesn't get them to the place that they're aspiring to be. Um, and I just am thinking as an educator, like, how can I better, you know, get, how can I get these students to, um, you know, buy into, I don't, I don't know if that's the correct word, but buy into these culturally inclusive lessons, but how can they, if they don't know their past, if they don't know their history, if they don't know um, how valuable their people were in building this nation, you know? So I think this is a great cause. I'm so happy to be a part of it. I'm glad you guys invited me. Um, and it's, you know, it's really emotional because I feel like I'm getting it from so many different levels, you know? I'm, I just started to realize how, uh, you know, well, I guess I've always kind of known, but the school system is one of these very um, racist systems. And I, mean, I have a, you know, principal here, you guys are educators, but like for years and years, I've been implementing these tests to these black and brown kids and they don't show what these kids know. And it's, it's, it's so wrong. And it's done nothing, you know, and these, these tests, these requirements, you know, it started back with like no child left behind and trying to, to basically, you know, prop up education, but in, in their quest to, you know, bring scores up and teach kids things that they needed to know, they further marginalized black and brown students by these test scores. So, I mean, I was in a school where, um, you know, black and brown kids were scoring 30 and 40 you know, percents and white kids are scoring 80 and 90 percent. What does that do to kids? What does that do to children's self-esteem? They, we were constantly told that we were in a failing school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was always like, had to be that cheerleader and say, you guys are not failing, you know, failures. You know, this is, a, I would have to tell them like, this system is not, this is not fair what you're being held to. Not to say that they shouldn't be learning, but that to be told that, you know, because their scores are low, you know, that they are failing and that they are not um, doing as well as white people in, in their country. I feel like that is just a horrible, horrible thing to do to children. Um, 
and also when I say that doesn't show what they know, um, you know, the, our privileged form of learning, you know, the, you know, reading and writing, I'm just starting to learn a little bit more about um, um, that topic, you know, how can we show what these students really know, we know the tests are culturally biased, the kids don't relate to them a lot of times, um, or they're, you know, they're, they're, um, the language, you know, their second, English is their second language. So, you know, I just, I don't, I think it's the, the two are related, you know, uh, yes, we need to abolish history, but I feel like these test scores or these tests and things like that, is, they're doing a lot of harm as well, you know, and, and we, we do need to find, yeah, sorry. I, I agree 100, 100%. There, there's so much we can cover. I think that this, this abolishment bill is going to open the door to so many other aspects of racism in, in education. It's like just the start of everything. Um, I want to make sure we get you know the rest of our panel. And did anyone else from the panel want to comment on the video clip? And then I can introduce everyone else. Any more comments on the uh, video clip? Is everybody muted? Um, this is Alexandra Eidenberg. I'd love to talk about the video clip. Okay. Um, so I remember thank when you. that first- Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Thanks, Malika. First of all, um, an honor to support you in this effort. I could not be more proud to be by your side and helping you usher through this important legislation. And Representative Ford, thank you for taking on the hard bills and really pushing strong. Um, I remember when that um, first came out and we talked about history books and for me, it really, um, it, it came home to the fact that I'm raising four kiddos. I had four kids in three years. I have a three-year-old, a five-year-old and two seven-year-olds and I'm a product of Chicago public schools. And so I had the privilege of going to Lincoln Elementary and later Lane Tech. And while I was at Lincoln, um, it was the feeder school for Cabrini Green. And I remember being, there was three tracks and you were in the American American track, the gifted track, or the IB track. And it really played out as almost like segregating tracks, like it really just kind of divided the school. And I had the privilege as a child to have a very good friend, um, Lauren Savage, and she recently actually passed away, which has been devastating. But as I saw what I was growing up with history classes, um, I, I was very lucky to have this friend, Lauren, and this video really reminds me of it because what we learn as young children is what impacts our future. And those early years are so critical for understanding. And Malika, when you came to me and you said, this is important for black children so they understand where they came from, but it's also really important for white children so that they see the black children as their peers. And that is exactly what Lauren was teaching me when I was a kid. And so Lauren used to tell these amazing stories. And when I was a kid, I just thought they were just these wild stories, but really what she was teaching me was about the glory days and pre-enslavement. And she shared them in the most miraculous way. And Lauren was one of the smartest people I've ever known. And she was very lucky to be in a family that taught her those things. But the issue is, is that most people do not grow up in a family where you get to learn about pre-enslavement or the glory days and have that experience in either the classroom or your home. And very sadly, many folks rely on the education system to teach everything to our kids because they don't get that at home. And so when the materials that are presented to our children are not factual and they lack the detail needed to tell them the truth, that is a problem that creates systemic racism and allows for white supremacy. And I am grateful that I had a Lauren in my life, but not everyone does and not everyone will. And so right now we're living this COVID-19 crisis, even before the crisis you're hearing um, Vanessa talk about it, Dr. Allen talk about it. It is so hard to teach social studies. It's been hard for a long time, especially when you're teaching to the test. And so when you teach the test, incorporating social studies is already hard. And if you don't have teachers like Dr. Allen or Vanessa that care to go beyond those tests, textbooks, we end up in a situation where kids are learning lies. And those lies become the reality. And that plays out on a regular basis. Um, my mom 
is an educator for years, my undergrads in early child education, and my mom specializes in multicultural education. My grandfather um, founded Columbia College, a, a, a college that was created for women and minorities to have access to education. And so I've had the privilege of growing up in communities of folks that wanted to do more and do better and learn more. But unfortunately, we don't see that happening across the country. We don't see that in Illinois. We don't see it the same in every district. We have a lot of districts here in Illinois and a lot of teachers that, that want to do better and do more, but we don't have the ability. And when our textbooks share lies and we're investing in those textbooks, it's just time to put the brakes on. And I will tell you as a mom of four kids, as we're approaching the school year with e-learning, it's already hard enough. Why teach lies? Why incorporate social studies when we can teach civics and we can focus on creating quality education online and not wasting our time reading lies. And so when I see that CBS clip, I think about the fact that every school has a different offering. Every household has a different offering. Right now, we're at a critical juncture where we can put the brakes on and focus on high quality curriculum and move forward later and really have the opportunity to teach folks the facts. Um, and I really wish Lauren was here today. Um, Interestingly, she passed away a week ago, and I know how important this effort was to her, and I know that she would have been just a frontline person pushing for this, and I feel like for all the kiddos out there, not everyone has a friend like her, and not everyone has the same ability to get multicultural education in their household, and so thank you everyone for fighting to put the brakes and halt and abolish education until we can do it right. All right. Um, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Ray? I want to expand on that because, right, you said that they're spreading lies, which took me to not only do we have to be accountable, but the authors, they're getting the information from somewhere and then somebody is not checking the checker. That's what it amounts to. It's, it's starting there to who is telling the story. So now we have to put people in place that know the story, or at least we now got to check after them. You know what I mean? Maybe add someone that is a part of a Black American history or the heritage that is sits on the board or is the author or can um, write a preface for it or something. We need, we need us in there with them because we no longer can have them, the white America, tell our story. So this is bigger than what I even imagined just even having this conversation is just making my mind just, you know, I'm just thinking and, and, and encouraged by everything that everyone is saying. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, right. It starts with the, the textbook. It starts with the words that they're reading. They, maybe perhaps they don't know that they're spreading lies. Maybe they're just taking what they have researched and used it just to get the credit to be an author. Therefore, they feeling like they're doing what they need to do as their career or job. So we got to go all the way back now and just make sure that whatever is coming out thus far, moving forward, that we are on top of that as well. Lisa Ray, you're absolutely right. If you look, recognize in the clip, the clip said we were on the 16th edition of the published book. So 16 times the book had been published and spread it misinformation it over, and over, again. over and over and over again. And it was written without a doubt by white men. And so what society has done to us as a society is it's pitting us against one another because you will hear a lot about the white man almost <laughs> being evil to society the way that we're gonna talk about the white man. And it's so unfortunate, let's get it right. Because when the books were written, the books were written with only white men from a white man's perspective. And that is a problem. That is not America. And so that's why we're here today. And I think um, Malika is gonna continue to introduce the panel. Yes, yes. Uh, Pim and Rami wanted to uh, comment on the discussion so far on the video clip. Uh, Pim is a historian and also a filmmaker. And I don't know if you want me to mention he's on the um, Illinois no. Arts Council. No, okay. no, we, we, we right. just skip that part. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. It's been a pleasure uh, listening to the comments that you all have been making and working in this um, 
on behalf of the changing of history is excessively important. So I'm going to give a little background, but I want to start with a quote. Napoleon Bonaparte said his decision to destroy the authority of Black people in Haiti was not based as much on the consideration of commerce and money as on the need to block forever the march of Blacks in the world. And let that sink in for a minute. Haiti, the first free Black country after you know, slavery or during that period of colonialization, his effort was to construct some information that would keep Black people from moving forward in the world and ever taking control again. So how do you justify subjugating a people? You justify it by creating a history that says they did nothing and that you did everything. And that is what we have been taught over and over and over again. So we, someone said earlier that the parents have to take some responsibility in teaching the history. But that is basically historically not what has happened anywhere in the world. No. Nobody has, has taken that responsibility other than the teachers. When we talk about the fact that Black people came from kings and queens, yes, a couple of us did. But more of us came from the educators and the engineers and the scientists and doctors. We were not all educators. It should not be expected to be. Next, why are we educating young people at all? Are we trying to teach it from the perspective of creating people to deal with resistance? Or are we trying to create people to deal with acceptance? Mm. The history that we have been taught has taught us to accept our plight in this country and not assume that we have the greatness within us to make a change and to move it forward. Mm -hmm. So how do we change that? So in 1967, I'll give, give this little history. 1967, I was part of the student movement and the chair of the student workshop at the National Black Power Conference that was held in Philadelphia. And so as a high school student, I came back to Chicago and we developed a manifesto that we presented to the Board of Education. We closed the schools down. We had 35,000 young people to walk out of schools. And every Monday, we boycotted the school with the purpose of getting Black history in the schools. Uh, black teachers, Black administrators, even Black businesses, because none of those existed within the framework of the school system. We were able to accomplish that and move it forward. And then to sit here today and hear that we have gone backwards in the educational process is disturbing. Jump forward, 2000 working as the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Jusama Museum of African American History. We worked with CPS to develop the interdisciplinary African and African American uh, syllabus and lessons to be taught within the schools in conjunction with the law. All This is a copy of that, one of the books that we did for the state. As you can see with that, it says the Illinois Commission, uh, and it deals with Black history with subjects like, um, and let me do this really quick because I know we need to move on. With subjects like African women and the original and the origins of mathematics and African women and their role with that. The pyramids of Giza, the libraries of Mali, African presence in America before Columbus, Maafa, the great tragedy, was it a trade? Jean-Baptiste Point du Sable, the father, founding uh, father of uh, Chicago. Civil war, women in the civil war. Um, the economic vestiges of enslavement, built on bondage, which was about the Ivy League schools that, that used slave wages to build Harvard and uh, all the, and Yale and universities like that. And it goes on and on and on. So the information, in fact, is available. The, the challenge is how do we get people to allow it to be taught in schools? When we introduced this, we did the training to teachers and parents one of the parents came up to me afterwards and said that they didn't want this history being taught because they felt that their children would be angry. It is that anger that will move us towards making the kinds of changes that are necessary 
to be able to construct a vision of the future that will allow our children to see a success ahead of themselves. What is the purpose of education? I go back to that again. For Black people, it has to be freedom. It has to be the ability to restore ourselves to our traditional greatness. If we're not teaching that, what are we teaching? So that's my opening statement. And in terms of the uh, video, I don't think they went far enough. At some point, we have to address the fact that this educational system was designed to in, ensure European domination. And they have been teaching the history to, to make that happen forever. Say that, say that one more time, because I don't know if they get said that was big. Yeah, what I said was that history has been, in essence, that history has been taught to ensure European domination. Because as long as you look at what they do and you say that they did everything in the world that is great, they gave us everything, then you will not question where they are. One other little point, all of us that have children, when we take that bottle of baby food and we, and we feed our children in the morning, what is it that they see that is good? It is the face of that white baby on that bottle. And every time you put it to their face, that is what they see. Not a reflection of themselves and the beauty of themselves, but they see a little white baby. And we take that spoon and we feed them with it. And they be begin to believe that that is what is good. Now, Randy, I have a question. Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, that's okay. good. Okay, so are you saying that if we teach them that the children may become angry and therefore we can't control their, their thought process or what they may do after that? Because I was thinking, let the anger come because we still got to start somewhere. And that to me is where the parents come into play because they still need to know outside of them being angry. So am I clear on that's what you are, were saying? That's what the parents were saying, yeah. And you, you know, if you were kidnapped as a child and you were taken in and all you knew, ever knew was this mother or father that has raised you and they have basically been good to you. And then 20 years down the line, you find out that you were kidnapped and here's your real family. How do you deconstruct your love for these people that have raised you all this time? Because there is a part of it that has to be deconstructed. You have to be, you have to roll them back to refine yourself. And so in our case, because we have been taught historically that everything black is bad, from, from devil's food cake to, to our hair, mm. that, our, that there's something fundamentally wrong with our hair and our noses, and it is perpetuated in the educational system. So unless we change those things, how do we feel better about ourselves? And the problem is, and, and I, I've said this often, a lot of times we really just want to be accepted. We don't want to be successful. We don't want to create change. We just want somebody to accept us and let us in the door. And the reality is that getting in that door also means that you have to reconstruct the relationship so that you are on an equal path. So Lisa Randy, Ray, let me ask this. Go on. Let me ask this then. Let me speak towards this. And so you said the bottle of, of, of um, baby, baby food mm -hmm. with the white baby on it. Then now that takes us back to branding. That takes us back to business. That takes us back to the type of business that Black folks do, meaning are we courageous or have capital enough to be able to start a business for us, by us, for us? Well, that's, that's, a legitimate, that's a legitimate question. Let me just take it one step further. There was a test that was done, uh, a medical test with, with peel. And they had a black peel and a white peel. The, the, the black peel had medicine in it. The white peel was a placebo. And they gave it to these people. The people that took, took the black peel didn't get better, even though it was medicine in the bottle, in, in, in the peel. And the people that took the white peel got better. It is because they were psychologically mm -hmm. have been trained to believe that anything that's black can't be good. And so unless we begin to look at, let's take a history that is told through the eyes of the people that are connected to it. Because if I am black and someone, and 
a, uh, edu- a, a um, performing uh, reference. So if someone brought to me the story of Shirley Temple and they said, I want to make this Shirley Temple movie, my response to them would be, cool, we do the movie, but we tell it through the eyes of Bo James. Mm-hmm. Because that is where my nature is. If we are educated, are we going to tell these enslaved people what these folks really did to them to create the consequences to, to make them feel even enough for them to say, okay, we know what you did in the past, but we've got to make a future that wraps around the ability for us to not to forgive because we should not forgive what you've done, but we should understand it and allow ourselves to move forward. So, so how about this one? Fast forward mm-hmm. to today, the black pill, the white pill. President Obama had Obamacare, or you can have the Affordable Care Act. Some people said, I don't want Obamacare. I want the Affordable Care Act. Don't give me that Obamacare. Yes. It's the same right. thing. Exactly. So, I mean, because look at- because <laughs> what, they have, what has happened with them is that they have, have been taught that we brought no value to the world. And the reality is that if it was not for the African, we would not be speaking at all. Not, not just not English and some other language. We would have no word. We would have no man. We would have no, no education or, or medical system at all. Yeah. So and how many so, more do we have to introduce, Malika? Uh, we have Joseph Edelin. Hey, everyone. Hey, Joseph, yeah, Joseph, welcome. Yeah. Joseph is an educator as well, and he writes curriculum, and he heard about our movement with the abolishment of history lessons, and he reached out, and he's written a book. He's, he's a phenomenal man, absolutely phenomenal. Joseph? Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the time being here. Um, I know we have a limited time, so I'm going to say what I can say. Um, Brother uh, Rami, you were definitely speaking truth on that. The idea that we as uh, Black people have created everything on this earth is an absolute truth, and I'm an educator. I've been a classroom teacher for the past 20 years. I teach seventh grade social studies. 100% of my kids are African-American children for the past 20 years. Um, and so I, over that time period, have recognized that the curriculum does not reflect who we are as a people. And, and, and in the best case scenario, it starts in slavery, right? In the worst case scenario, it doesn't even start there. It starts somewhere long, you know, way later in, with you know, dogs and, and water hoses. And so as a teacher, I said, something's not right about this. I can't sit up here in front of these children and teach them lies and, and, and half truths and, or no truths and, you know, every day. And so I took my resources and the education that I had, and I wrote a book. And for those who don't know, like I wrote this book, it's called Through Our Own Eyes, A Journey in African-American History. And it literally is written for parents and teachers to be able to help teach them African-American history that doesn't start in slavery. Everything inside the book is geared towards teaching. So there are lessons, there are, there are activities, there are video links, there are STEM connections, there's all that in there. And so when you're having this conversation about abolishing history uh, lessons, I'm all for it. But I'm also all for it just the way I think about abolishing the police. Everybody's talking about abolishing the police right now because of what's going on in terms of police brutality. And the police system was set up the exact same way the education system was set up for black people during slavery. The original uh, police officers were slave catchers, right? And so the original education system was designed not to educate black people, but to keep us ignorant. And so when people talk about abolishing the police, I'm talking about it and people people are saying, you gotta get rid of that system because it's broken, it's not working. But you can't just get rid of police. You have to replace it with something else that works, that actually works for the people, right? We're talking about mental health professionals. We're talking about counselors, right? So you gotta replace it with something. So when I'm talking about getting rid of uh, or abolishing history curriculum, because that system is broken, we need to do something about that. But we have to replace it with something. We have to replace it with something that reflects the history and the culture of all marginalized people, as Dr. Allen was saying, but specifically people of color and African-American people. But we have to also remember that this is a system. And so if we are getting rid of history curriculum, we can't just imagine that you know, white supremacy only exists in social studies class. White supremacy exists in every other class too, math, right? We all went through high school and we all were taught the Pythagorean theorem and we all were taught that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And the Pythagoras was the, you know, the genesis of all that. But what we don't, what we're not taught is that Pythagoras lived and studied in ancient Egypt for 33 years, which was ruled by black people. 
And so you're gonna, you know, you're gonna talk about racism in the curriculum. We gotta teach that you know, it doesn't have to just live in, in social studies. If you're talking about English, right? We all, you know, we all went through school and we all were had to learn the classics, you know, Moby Dick, you know, uh, Little Women, Huck Finn. Why are those the classics? Why are there no African authors that are classics? Why are there no Latinx authors that are classics, right? If you're talking about science, we all went through school. We all had to learn about the European Renaissance and the European Enlightenment. And neither one of those things would not have happened without African people called the Moors who came from North Africa and civilized the entire uh, peninsula of Spain and Portugal. Hello. Nothing would have okay. existed without okay. African yes. people. Yes. And so if, if you're talking about abolishing a, a, a curriculum, right, then we have to start looking at the entire system and then redesigning that system so that it reflects the people um, that are being taught, right? And it's, it's like just said in the chat, it's a Eurocentric education. We need to replace it with an Afrocentric education to teach the, the majority of people who are in, um, in these public schools. And to be clear, it, and, and I think um, uh, uh, the sister was talking, oh, the sister uh, Alvarado was talking about the, um, the, the standardized test. If we're talking about changing curriculum, that we also have to have the same conversation about changing tests. Because if we're changing curriculum, not changing tests, we're setting kids up for failure. Exactly. Right? And most of our, uh, and, I, and I read the bill, uh, Representative Ford, and, I, and you were talking about re requirements for graduation and promotion. And the and majority in this country of promotion uh, tests in social studies are US history-based tests, right? Eighth grade, fifth grade, uh, uh, and, and, and high school. So if we're changing curriculum, we also have to be talking about changing tests because if we're not, and we're just changing curriculum and we're not learning, and they don't, they're not learning what they have to for this test, then they're just gonna, you know, retention, not being able to go to the next grade level, not have the skills necessary to, to move on. So we have to be talking about a lot of these things at the same time, um, but I'm here for it. And I think it's a fantastic thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's long overdue. So I think you're right, Malika, I'm sorry. Let me just address that. You're absolutely right. The standards say that you have to be tested on the state um, on the state curriculum. And so we do have to address it. And for the record, we will get to the bill drafts. Just note, Joseph, that they're bill drafts. And we're going to work together to make sure that we get the proper draft so that we can file the correct one. And so we did not want to file anything and ask for input. We wanted to draft something just to start. And then we're gonna make sure that we get it right before we file it. I, I, knew, I knew somebody smart like you were gonna come up with, we gotta stop the math, we gotta stop the science. I'm like, oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? That's what I was saying, it's bigger than just this. We, we've unveiled a whole big plethora of stuff that we are gonna have to accomplish. Exactly. Talking revolution, if we're talking revolution, revolution is about changing an entire system, taking the whole system and replacing it with something brand new. And that's what I think we're trying to do here. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add to keep in mind that the curriculum that was developed for CPS specifically covers every uh, grade area, every, um, it covers English, it covers math, it, it covers all areas. Uh, and the reason that it has, was not uh, actualized is because of this issue of testing, but the material is there. So we keep talking about this testing and it really reminds me that, first of all, I've always been taught, you know, here's what the facts are, here's what we're learning at home, here's what we know. But when you go to school, you answer the questions the way your teacher told you to, and you answer the questions the way the book told you to. And I think that's such a broken system that, you know, it, you know, as someone who, you know, I happen to be Jewish and being taught that whatever you learn about the Holocaust, we know what the facts are, but you answer the questions the way the book says, you answer the questions the way your teacher says. And that broken system is happening in so many different cultural groups and most, you know, importantly in African American history in the most devastating of ways. And so that whole teach the test mentality and just answer the question the way the book told you, that permanently imprints in the kids' minds. And it's not, it's not okay and it's not fair. And you know, Joseph, you were talking about that Eurocentric education. And I was typing that into the chat at the same time. Like the Eurocentric education is not working any longer. And we need a new lens, and that lens needs to be comprehensive. So thank you for all the work you're doing on <laughs> curriculum and everyone else here who's writing curriculum. We desperately need change. 
Yes, yes, we do. I just got to say one before you call on the next one. Can we start with history and make sure that we um, make it known that we have to have a revolution in education so that um, our kids won't be learning nothing? They're going to join on that bandwagon. They'll be like, no more teaching anything because it's not right. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, if we could just work on um, the subject, what do you think, Joseph um, and, and, and Lisa Ray? I mean, is it enough? We can never be satisfied. But is it enough to have a discussion on the history from all areas of subjects, you know, because we could talk about the history of math, we could talk about the history of science, we could talk about the history, and we could get it all right in the history. Um, and then, you know, move broader to make sure that we correct the history and the science and in the math. Yeah, I think, I think you, uh, you have to, I mean, I think you have to start somewhere, right? So starting with, with history, I think it's a good part. I think it's a good start. I think I'm just cautious about falling into a white supremacist trap of saying, hey, okay, they don't wanna teach history anymore. Cool, we'll, we'll not teach history standards anymore. And, and you know, they're talking about replacing it with something else, but we're just gonna waylay that for a couple of however many years. And we're still gonna teach white supremacy in these other courses. So like while they've taken the, the white supremacy out of history, we still got them over here, you know? And I, I just, I would, I, what I would propose, and you know, and, and I'm glad you said it's a draft because we can all have these conversations and I think it's beautiful, um, to have something ready to go to give them, say, hey, we want to move this out the way because this is racist and it teaches white supremacy, but here's what we're proposing and it's ready and it's ready to go right now so that they don't have a, a, a window or a foot in the door to say, oh yeah, we're gonna get rid of this and then not have to replace it with anything else um, to, to be able to stall on, on giving our kids history because that's what they've been doing this whole time is not giving our kids history. And it's another reason for them to do that. So who would write that bill for us? Because if we have to do it that way collectively, we don't wanna have to come back and get veto. We want to be able to present it to them in the right form in which it needs to be in the first place. Who would do that for us? Who, who has that power, education? Malika? Representative Ford. <laughs> Tell me, because I, I need to know. I told you I'm going to ask some questions. <laughs> we, that's what we all are going to do. Um, we have a start, and we all are going to make sure that we write the bill so that, uh, Lisa Ray, you've been doing this. You're talking about we don't want no veto. We want it to pass right <laughs> at the beginning. And, and that's right. That's what we want. And that's why we didn't file anything to have any objections. What we wanted to do was have something that we could start a conversation with, get um, people involved in writing it. And who writes legislation? We all write legislation. You know, if we just let one person, one group write it, then we got exactly what we have now, the history books and the laws on the books that we are um, living under. So this is an opportunity for us to not only write the legislation right, write the curriculums correctly, and write the books correctly to publish them. So this is huge. And I'm very happy to know that we can also set the, the tone for the entire um, curriculum of education as relates to um, uh, literature, as relates to science and math. You know, So that's going to be a part of it all. But I know um, uh, Malika is getting um, probably antsy about moving this along. So go ahead, Malika. <laughs> Okay, I want to open it up uh, for questions, but we have one more panelist uh, that's come on, Reven Fellows. Reven? Is he there? Yes, yeah, I'm hey. here. Hey, Reven. <laughs> How y'all doing? I've been enjoying the history. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Reven is a uh, founder of NBAC, uh, National Black Agenda uh, Convention, and um, He's come to every press conference that we've we've had and been such a great supporter. He's also an educator and um, he's behind this 100%. So take it away, Reason. And then we're gonna open up for questions. Okay, well, thank you so much for convening. Definitely Rev Ford for the champion. Most people don't know he's an educator, so he's born for this moment. Uh, being a teacher, direct, and knowing what the children need. So I've been honored to I'm a co-founder of the African-American Heritage Museum and 
Black Veterans Archives that did a war in New Orleans, founded by Reverend Dr. Charles Trump, who's one of the top folk artists in the country. And he's built two museums to recognize the only black museum that recognizes 7,246 African American men and women who fought and died in Vietnam. And we have that red. You can put DC and look on the wall, but it's not by culture. So, what we got to do is deal with our veterans who died but and fought in these wars. Every war that America or anybody fought, the black man and the black veteran was front and center, fighting with honor at the front lines and giving their lives. So every flag that's flown across this world has black blood in it, the red. We could dishonor other parts, but the red has black blood of our brothers who fought and died for the history and glory of our history that we will fight and we are loyal. So I'm just honored to be here. I'm also the co-founder of the National Black Agenda Consortium and I've also been a member with the A. Philip Randolph Pullman Porter Museum, the first black labor union. Most people got to understand the history. We love Martin Luther King, it's an honor, but there's no Martin Luther King unless Asa Philip Randolph organized and bring him to Washington to give a keynote address. He was not the organizer. And A. Philip was considered documented the most dangerous black man in America. So we got to set the record straight. Uh, history has just got to be told. I used to work for Hoffman and Michelin uh, in Batavia. I worked there two years. I worked in the house, in the warehouse rep for it, I didn't tell you. I went around in the whole, the whole, the whole area moving books and I saw the racism and neglect of that. So you're right on point. And I just want to close with this, a point of point, a point of history. Uh, on the, on the dime, that the, the, the Theodore Roosevelt is on the dime. But there's a black woman named Thelma Burke. She is the sculpture. She's a folk artist, a black woman sculpture that on the dime. Whenever you walk around with a dime in your pocket, you've got a black woman that did the artwork of that money, because we should always be on the money. Thank you, and thank you, and thank you. All right, thank you so much, Reeve, and thank you for, for supporting this movement. Um, before we take questions from the public, um, Representative Ford wants to pull up the bill so everyone can see just a synopsis of what this draft of the bill looks like. And I sent it to the panelists. And it's also in the chat, and early on in the, the chat. chat. Mm -hmm. Representative Ford, is this one or are you? Is Which this one is this? So you can see. Um, this one is 21. Let me see, one, two, two. Which this one? one? Can you go um, so I can, oh, that's the four page. So, we, so you all know what we have here. We have two bill drafts. And um, this is the one that completes. I'm gonna scroll up a little bit for you. That's good. I'm just trying to make sure that, okay, I have it. I know which one. So the bill, we have two bill drafts. Thank you, Erica. So what we have here is a bill draft that only includes K through 12 education. And our goal is to suspend the current history teaching in Illinois and teach civics until we can get a rewrite of the um, history teachings in Illinois. So the bill will read to ensure that students sure that sure that's that 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 me. You've locked in twice. Locked in twice. Can you kick one? You kick one. Kick out. The one is just the audio. Should, right. Should go. I couldn't do it. I was trying. Okay. Is it gone? I'm getting there. Thank you. Oh, all right. Just the audio. Okay. Oh, can't kick you <laughs> out. I'll see if I can. Let's see. All right, I've removed one of you. Okay, perfect. That's the one we needed moved. All so right. What the K through um, twelve would do is ensure that students in this in this state obtain a broad, inclusive, and uh, multi 
perspective understanding about the history of the United States. And we will ask that beginning 2021, um, that this happens. We don't want to really just drop it immediately because there are some students that need to um, still take the test, as I think one of the panelists said. So um, we want to make sure that we roll this in the right way. So um, the first bill that you have will be only for K through 12. And the second bill that you um, have will be inclusive for K through 12 through um, higher ed. So we will be working with ISB, uh, Illinois State Board of Education for the first bill. And for the second bill that you have, it will be um, the Illinois State Board of Education, including um, the Board of Higher Education. And that's the bill up now. And it will ask that not only do we stop teaching um, history in the state of Illinois, but we also go to the higher education uh, department and ask that the um, higher education set standards and guidelines for how they're going to um, allow for uh, history classes to be taught in the um, universities. Only for the public universities, that's the only um, jurisdiction that we uh, have is to deal with our public universities. So two bills, one dealing with just K through 12, the second one dealing with K through 12 and our higher education uh, institutions in Illinois. This will allow us to not only talk about the inclusion of blacks, but we know that um, women have been excluded. We know that um, the Jewish community we know that the Latin um, community have been excluded. And how do we know? Because when Malika and we will and Erica, and it, it, when we all um, got together, it was really about Alexander. We, when we got together, it was all about making sure that we corrected the history for Blacks. But we're, we were fine with that. But people ask us to include their history. The women say it to us that, you know what, it's not fair the way we're depicted in, in history and we want to be included in the rewrite. We have people from the Jewish co community tell us we need to be included in this too because we feel that we've been excluded. We had people from the Latin um, community tell us the same thing. And so we felt that not only do we continue to push for an accurate account of Black history, and get um, an accurate account of black history, even though it may be uh, a separate um, study, we also know that we have to have a inclusive study because there are blacks that not only want a, a thorough history and whites and Hispanics want a thorough history of the account of American history, but people also wanna go deep into black history as well. And so we want to make sure that we are able to do both in America. We can have a rich um, discussion and a rich understanding about Black history, and we can have the same discussion that's inclusive in our teachings. Why, why do we know that it's possible now? We know that it's possible now because before we didn't know any better. Now we have um, historians that have brought to light the truth about people, the truth about Blacks, the truth about women, the truth about um, Latin um, people. We now know that there is some truths out there that people cannot hide. And that's why we see a lot of uprising in the streets where statues are being torn down and people are angry because they were told something totally different about the people that are displayed in our uh, communities. And so now people say, tear it down because it's not true. And so our goal is to uh, make sure that we get it right and we can only get it right if everyone is included. And I'll just end with a story that uh, I told a lady um, about how more now than ever we see interracial marriages. And I said, you know, you have black men marrying um, white women and white women marrying black men and, and, and all different 
But the truth is, they don't know one another. As much as they think they know one another, they don't. You know, they go to family um, affairs and um, the black man will go to a family affair with all white people and a few blacks. And what is it that that white family know about that black man? Nothing more than what the TV tells and just what they say about, oh, he's a good black guy. But do they really, really respect him as a human being just like their brothers and sisters of their white skin? When we fix history and teach them and teach our own people how to represent themselves and what the history really tells, I think we're gonna be in good shape. So we could even make sure that people that's in love could really love each other and have some good culture going on at those Christmas parties. But it really can't happen because I think people are, are ashamed of their culture because of the way the world has displayed it. And so if we're gonna have this interracial relationships, we gotta make sure that everybody celebrates their culture at Christmas or whatever holidays and family get togethers they may have. And with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Malika to um, carry on with the discussion on how we should move forward with the bills. Moving forward, we put in the chat and for those who are on Facebook Live, um, you can reach out to us, um, EvanstonLiveTV at gmail.com if you wanna join in the movement um, and volunteering. It takes numbers to make this happen. So definitely reach out to us and uh, that's, our, that's our next plan of action. Did anyone have any questions out there? Anyone raising their hand, sending in a question? Okay, Lisa Ray? <laughs> okay, sorry, um, but not really. Um, so <laughs> what happens with um, our public school um, versus our private school system? like because they have different rules and regulations and laws for them so are we going to actually put in our amendment here or is that the right word i'm using in our bill am i saying the right thing yeah yeah mm -hmm. yes okay um how do we speak towards that or is that a difference at all do we need to do that you know we do need to do that uh, we know that um, the state set standards and they set curriculums for the public universities as well as um, you know, the school boards for um, private schools. Private they set but what we can do is change the textbooks and then we can work with those private schools and say, look, are you really gonna be um, using these same textbooks that's um, not inclusive, that's um, leading to um, a biased society that's racist? I think we can move the Catholic schools, the private schools to purchase the right books. And um, I think that you bring that up, we have to make sure that we reach out to them so that they could be a part of crafting this bill and making sure that they are part of rewriting the um, history. Someone told me from, um, from Fox News, and this is good, they put it in a way because they believe we should be teaching religion in schools and that we should bring prayer back into the schools. And what they said to me, they thought they were being slick, but I agree with them because they said, well, if you're gonna teach all of this, why don't you teach Christianity? Why don't you teach you know, the different types of beliefs in the history? Because all of that had something to do with history as well. And I totally agree because as a Catholic, I mean, the history of the Catholic church should be in the books. I mean, if I could, I would be ashamed of some of the things that the Catholic Church did and participated and was silent on. And so we should bring them all on board. And um, I'm, I'm happy they thought they were being slick by trying to get religion in, but I know we should have all of it in the history. So does that mean that we have to now put together a committee that is going to be over looking at these textbooks yeah yes <laughs> and so it's good you say that too because we have a um audit of all of the um 
school districts in the state of Illinois. There are 852 school districts that we um, in Illinois, we worked on getting a audit of what the school districts, the, not the Catholic schools, not the private schools, but the public schools. What- That's 825 public, 52 public schools? 852 school districts, which school districts, school districts could have multiple um, schools in it and lots of, in Illinois, that's the way it is. So it could be 852 school districts, but it may have like, it could be 10,000 schools total in all of those 852 school districts. So Chicago, for example, had, um, we, we know it's school district 299. And Chicago um, has lots of high schools, lots of grammar schools. So 299 has a lot of different schools um, in their district. Therefore, every school district will have multiple schools and and, and so we have a lot of schools that we're doing the audit on. And the audit is asking for the schools to tell us the curriculum that they're teaching and we need the publishers of the books that they are using. That's gonna help us get to the bottom of what's being taught, which we already know um, what's being taught. So we do need a committee, Alisa Ray, and I think Malika was going to um, open that up at some point about um, a committee to um, be a part of the curriculum, the publishing, and um, and one other. So. Yes, our our plan was to make sure that the bill got to the Senate, make sure we pass uh, this next voting session, and when we got into the Senate, we start working out the curriculum. But right now, we are putting a team together of people who write curriculum, and we got some amazing people. Right here, um, we've met several from our past um, press conferences. So I think it's gonna be, they can't throw that at us anymore. Well, you don't have anybody to write the curriculum. We don't have a curriculum. No, we got a ton of people talented and have written curriculums and ready to come together and write another one. So. So a curriculum committee and a, and a um, we have to have both the publishing as well. So those are two that I know. Um, because we're definitely taking the books, the textbooks out of Texas. We can do it right here in the state of Illinois. We, get, we have the talent to do it. And Lisa, I just wanted to make one comment uh, regarding what Lisa's uh, question was. There are a lot of people that have been doing this work for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, there are black publishing companies that currently exist that should be included within this process. Third World Press, mm -hmm. um, Paul Coates' um, organization, which is ta Coates' father, he has a publishing company. Um, the work that has been done in New Jersey by the Amistad Commission, the work that was done in Portland um, by the Amistad Commission there, um, there's tons of work that has already been done. We don't have to completely reinvent the wheel, but what I would suggest is that we look at two parameters for, for moving forward with this. One is that we look at how you teach Black, black uh, studies, not just what you teach, but how you teach it. And then also that we deal with what is being taught. And the derivative of that information has to come from those of us that have been um, involved with this for an extended period of time. That is not to say that people that are writing books now that, have, that are, are educators that are there now should not be involved. But what we, but what we tried to do with Amistad in Illinois was to create a database of all existing materials. So at least people would know what's out there. So if, if and there are a ton of people that have written on every subject area that we need to, to take a look at, make available to people. The other thing is that what we found within this process is that the history books are not being used across the board. There's no one single history book that people are using uh, in, every, in, in every school. You know, so we have to construct a new history book. One other thing and I'm done. So the other day they took down two statues. Uh, well, not the other day, but some time ago, they took down statues of Christopher Columbus. Uh, here in Chicago. It took one down that was downtown, and then they took one down that was in Little Italy. So as I was looking at that, I said, well, you know, if, they, if the Italians want to leave for Christopher Columbus statue up, that's on them. It's in their community if that's what they want to honor. 
However, that being pushed on all of us as a truth is something altogether different. And so as part of this process, let's take a look at those people that have been, that have created independent black schools. And there, there are those that are around that are still working that we need to include within this process. Yes, yes. And that came up in the hearing as well, having to train the teachers, because a lot of the downstate teachers have no idea about Black history. <laughs> None. Yeah, we, they don't know how to teach we, it. They don't know the information. They're not interested in it. So that also came up as well, the training. When we did the training here uh, for, the, for the CPS, we had uh, 400 people uh, every day. We did Three, three weeks in, in July, and then we did three weeks in August. And we got a lot of participation from the network chiefs and the principals, as well as uh, from teachers, uh, downstate as well as from Chicago itself. Yep. So keep in mind that we're going to get the history. We need to make sure that we have a committee for the curriculum and the publishing of diversity. So let's make sure that we Let's go ahead. I think before I um, pose a question to Malika, I think Lisa Ray had something to say. Yeah, really quickly. I just wanted you to take me through the process so I know how it goes. So we take the bill to the Senate first. No, we're going to start it in the House. We're going to yeah. we're going to we're going to draft it, get it right, and we're going to file it in the House, and we're going to pass okay. it in the House, and then it uh, um, go to the uh, Senate, and then on to the governor's desk. And, and then, and I, I, you know, we should have played that Schoolhouse Rock song. I know. Uh, uh, <laughs> just hey, a, I learned a lot from that song. <laughs> I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Yep, that's right. They don't have that no more. Right. No. <laughs> so two committees, is it that we think that we need, uh, Malika? Uh, so let's just open it up to that. What committees do we need? I know we need a... Uh, Publishing yeah, and the legislative. That was the three. Publishing, curriculum, and the legislative bill writing. Those are the ones. Okay, say it again. Publishing. So we, we need someone to be on the publishing part of the new books. We need someone to be on the curriculum committee to write the curriculum. And we need someone to be on, we need people to be on the bill, the legislative committee to write the um, bill to get it ready for filing. Now, everyone, regardless to what committee you're on, you, you're invited to be on them all and you're invited to make sure that you um, you give your input on each and every um, committee. So we don't have committee. to- How do you spell committee? How do you spell committee? Go ahead. M-M-I-T-T-E-E. -E. <laughs> right, okay, thanks. <laughs> I, I went to private school, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's good. I think that what we could do so that we don't have to make the decision today about what committees you want to commit to, we know the committees and Malika is leading it and she has everyone's um, email address. So we will create this chart and you could put yourself in the chart of where you want to be and um, who's going to be the chair of those so that we could get busy. Now, timeline is important because we want to abolish the teaching. Of, of history classes and we want to send a message strongly that this is what we want to do. We go back to Springfield in November for um, veto session. If we could pass a bill like this in veto session, that would be fantastic. And I think we can if this is something that we want to do. So we are right now in August, September, October, November. We got a lot of time to draft a bill that we believe that we could pass that's inclusive. And um, so that's the committee that we need to get busy right away to get this bill drafted. And I think Joseph, you'd be great to be a part of that committee. I know we said we're not gonna talk about it, but all, you know, I think that would be great. So Malika, you, you will lead up to getting everybody to pick which committees they're gonna be on? Yes, I put my email address in the chat so everybody can um, hit me up what they're most passionate about or if they want to be on all three committees. Yeah. But it's EvanstonLiveTV at gmail.com. You send that information to me. I'm excited because we have a lot of talented people here. 
and everybody could possibly, if they want, be right on the on the um, legislative committee. We may need everyone on that right now to get this done. So if you want to be on there, just let Malika know that you want to be a part of writing this curriculum. And I think that makes a lot of sense to make sure everyone's on that. I'm sorry, writing this bill. Mm -hmm. Congressman Ford, oh, I'm Malika, can you hear me? Yes. Um, could you give a preliminary head count on where you think the votes are uh, for the bill at this stage of the, the discussion? We don't have a bill number yet, so. Uh, but just know, anecdotally, on a nose count, uh, what do you what do you think? What's required? Where do you think you are? Oh, okay. What's required is sixty votes. Okay. To pass it in the House, and um, a simple majority in the Senate. Yes, and so I think that we could get there. I mean, now that we got Lisa Ray on board, I mean, we're gonna get everybody <laughs> voting for it. All the pressure's on Lisa Ray. Well, I was just thinking then, I was just thinking in my head, what other, you know, conscious Chicagoans that I can automatically get involved in. I definitely can have, and I was speaking with Malika about this, about, you know, Shaka Khan. Uh, Bill Duke is actually excellent because he had a small short film called um, Brown Skin Girl. Um, it was about the different, you know, uh, you, you know about it, right. Okay. And so he's a very conscious person and common. We know that Common is very conscious as well. So if we can get some notable people that I can, you know, that's why I'm taking notes and stuff. So as I verbally have a conversation with them, I want to get with you, Malika, to be able to send them something on a letterhead that they know that this is serious and that I'm actually a part of something that is moving forward. So I, I'll get with you guys to figure Le that out. Nisha Ray, um, Harry Lennox was a teacher in, in CPS, so he'd be a good person um, to include in this, and maybe even Robert Townsend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so yeah. Malika, right away, legislation. That's what we need to, I think that because Perry uh, Rami knows that we could get the, um, we, we are closer to getting the curriculum and the publishing done than we know. Because as you said, there's been a lot of people out there doing this for a very long time. So I maybe we should immediately um, get the bill drafted so that we could file that. How, how soon do you think we could get our heads together to get a bill to be filed in Springfield? That means we got to meet and we got to make sure that we get our ideas together and get it on paper. And just note, no matter what we do, whatever we file, somebody's going to disagree and there probably will be an amendment that have to be added or two amendments or three amendments. But Let's go strong, let's go big, and make sure that we get it just the way we want it for fouling. I would think that this is August the 15th, September 15th. That gives us one full month to put together a better draft than this. Okay. And while we're putting together the better draft, we need to build the idea of abolishing history teaching, but we can't let them spin us because what they want to say is that we're trying to erase history. Right. We're not trying to erase history. And what they will say all while we were doing interviews on, on Fox News and CNN and all, they were saying that Representative Ford is trying to erase history. That's furthest from the truth. You're just trying to have inclusive history. And so when we send the message out there, we're abolishing the history that's, that's biased, that's leading to racism and discrimination and hate in our, in our culture. That's what we're trying to do. Why continue to teach something when it's not right? Why should taxpayers continue to pay for textbooks, teachers to teach inaccurate history that leads to a biased, racist society? We shouldn't teach it. So that's what we have to make sure that people understand that we're not getting rid of history classes, we're suspending it. And if we can have a, I think someone earlier, Joseph may have said replacing something with police. With, well, if we can today get rid of the history books that we have and replace it with something, then we'll be happy to do that. But right now we don't have anything. And the question is, do we continue to feed the bad history 
when we know it's um, bad and inaccurate, or do we stop it now and bring it back when we have it um, um, a better accounting? Representative Ford, a question for you. I know that Devon Horton in District 65 in Evanston is a supporter. If, have you had an opportunity to speak with CPS uh, on their views with respect to the bill? I have spoken to CPS and, you know, of course they're not going to be um, in support right now. They are in support of teaching history, black history. And I'll tell you what that, that's great to teach black history and we need to teach black history. But what I know about teaching black history is black history is American history, is rural history. It's not just a pullout. And that's what CPS is prepared to do. They want to teach a section of history as black history. Well, we know that uh, black people were enslaved and came here in the time tells us 1619. But when we open the history books, that's not the way it works. The indigenous people and black people were here. And I think because of the work that black people have done, America was able to um, be brave enough to fight for the independence from Great Britain. But we don't get that type of praise. And so to just have a pullout, and that's what CPS is prepared to do, we don't need just a pullout. We're not a pullout. We are the fabric of America, and we should be from page one until the end of the book. Mm -hmm. Representative Ford and Malika, because we have this big call to action on legislation, I just want to say a little bit about We Will for those on the line who may not know. But We Will is an, an organization that Malika is on the board of, and we help women and girls uh, get a to be a part of the legislation process. And we very much support legislation that helps people of color. And so I just wanted to publicly announce that, um, you know, it is our privilege to be 100% uh, in continued support um, of, of this uh, call to action to remove or temporarily cease teaching American history and replace it with civics until we can both create and implement um, the proper history for everyone. And so also want to say any support that we can continue to provide from a legislative perspective, we want to do that. We're 100% we're um, here behind you. On a personal note, I have to say, just listening to everybody, I'm like over here bubbling up. Um, I, I was thinking about my, my own history and how I just happened to go to a public school where I had black teachers early on who taught me about my history. I also happened to have a father who uh, undergrad degree was in history. So what I didn't learn in school, I learned at home. And because he was a teacher, his friends were teachers, so I just got it all the time, but it really is not, it shouldn't be about privilege because that was just a privilege. I just happened to be born into that family to be able to get this kind of education. It really should be on purpose. It should be universal. It should be um, comprehensive, like everybody said. So I just wanted to share that. And one final note, I uh, was talking to a mentor friend of mine who is 87 years old. Um, she's taught me everything I know about diversity and inclusion, which is what I do for a living. And she used to be a school teacher. And she said back in the early 60s, she rewrote a history book um, with her students. And there she was, she's a white woman, but her, all of her students were black. So she rewrote a history book through her own uh, education with the education of her students and their families, they put that book together in order to teach from because she said she just couldn't use what was there. But what's interesting is last week, she sent me an article from 1968 from a newspaper in the North Shore discussing this exact problem. Like if I didn't show you the year, it could be today. And so I just thought, wow, 52 years and we've made very little progress. But I think now is the time. So I just wanted to express that now is the time. And I think we're going to see something different. No, not think. We will see something different. And my only sadness will be that in 100 years, I won't get to see the benefit and the reap, all the things we're reaping from what we're doing today. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's that.
let me tell you what it's just let me just make sure that Lisa Ray knows that this could be this is serious and I'm, I'm not trying to say that you don't understand how serious it is but you have a lot to lose as a as an entertainer stepping out on something like this the hate mail that I've been getting is unbelievable the names that I've been called is nasty and threatening. And just since we've been on here, I have a, a message that said, this guy, I don't blame him because he's ignorant. He doesn't know any better. And he said, <laughs> um, you shouldn't be embarrassed of your history, L.A. Ford. Twin the clock. You should be embarrassed of your asinine opinions, though. Now, what the heck? What, what's wrong with my opinion of one in inclusive history? So people are, not everybody wants an accurate account. So Lisa Ray, be ready for um, attacks. I am used to this. If I was not in this business right here, my, my skin is thick. I'm used to it already, you know? But like I said, that I've been waiting for something that I can sink my teeth into, that I believe in. And I believe this. So I guess I will be a part of that because uh, that's my opinion is like your opinion, you know, and that's why we're all here collectively together. We are feeling the same way and it's going to grow from here. So we will have others that's going to join us, that's going to appreciate what we're doing. It's going to support us and lend themselves to us because it still takes a village. And so I am a part of that village. I am ready and I was built for this. All right. All right. Great. That's Thank you. All right. Well, we have gone so over, but the conversation has been very productive. And I am very excited to get started working with everybody. We end the miseducation now. It ends starting now. No more miseducating our children. And I just want to thank everybody so much for your time. Before we end, were, were there any other questions? Any other questions? Go ahead, Lisa. Closing remarks, questions, closing remarks. Everybody, we, we, anybody that wanna close with something. We have questions, I think we have press on. If there are any questions from the press, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions and um, we could go from there. I'm just, I just have a quick question. I'm wondering if I could bring um, maybe my father in on one of the committees. He's, he's, yeah, he's an, he's been an educator for, you know, 50 years. And um, I think he brings um, a good perspective on the Latin community. Absolutely. So I think that in closing, if no one else has anything to say, uh, uh, Malika had the closing remarks, I would say that we have to make sure that um, we respond to the legislative um, bill draft. That's our first line of business to make sure that we get the bill drafted properly. Um, and so you have Malika's information. If we wanna set up some times, Malika would be heading up the uh, legislative um, bill draft uh, process. And um, our goal is to get the final um, bill draft ready to be filed by September um, the 15th. And then we could go from there and be prepared to go public with the bill uh, in the form that we all agree on and then be prepared to defend it and come to Springfield to um, testify and to, um, and to express your um, support for it. Um, in the meantime, we should be sending a strong message that the history is inaccurate and that it should be abolished until we get it right. And it's a good message, in my opinion. Thank you so very much, all of you, for taking your sunny Saturday out um, to talk about something that I believe is one of the most important um, issues that we can deal with in society today. And that is making sure that we are all respected um, in society and treated humanely. Uh, Lisa Ray, all right, now I'm gonna have to just say, I just love you. I, I've been like real oh. nice 
and, you know, I've been real nice all along. I can have one starstruck and everything, but God, Lee, you just fantastic. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you so very much. And, and we just love you in Chicago and you make us all very, very proud. And Malika, thank you so very much for reaching out to her and getting her to um, um, be a part of this. And, you know, you didn't have to respond to Malika. You know, you're a star and you got lots of more people than us people. I'm a star too. We, we know. Yes, <laughs> you are. <laughs> a lot of more people that you could be responding to in your circle out there in LA and New York. And, and um, but you responded to our star here. And so we thank you for um, answering that call. And I think it was God speaking to you. That, that Absolutely. You Absolutely. Because I was, I was waiting. I was waiting to meet people like you all, you know, and, and I'm not that engaged with my fans on Instagram. It was this, I think I hit you at, it was some ungodly hour of the night that I uh, uh, DM'd her, you know, um, and then she hit me back. But again, this, this, this also is going to help me too. You know, I don't want you, you know, us to think that it's just one-sided. We're all going to be up against the gun. We all going to be ridiculed. We all got to be strong and stand together. You know what I mean? And I know that, you know, some of Black Hollywood is not going to agree. And then I know Hollywood, you know, the ones that run Hollywood is not going to like it. But my career is not based on that because I truly believe what's for me is for me. And so this has to be a, even a bigger picture than even what I'm doing now. You know what I'm saying? So who knows what we can do with this and where we can go from here. You know, Lisa Ray, I keep uh, saying we're going to stop, but guess what? When you think about the way history is written, guess who writes write the movies? They write them from a perspective of the history that they were taught. Imagine when we teach the proper history, how the movies will change and how black people, Latinos, women, and the LGBTQ and the Jewish community will be betrayed in these films. We, we have something here that will change the world and make everyone treat be treated the way they should be treated, the way God wants his people to be treated. You know, we have the police, they learn from a racist and biased history books. That's why they are able to be, some of them are able to not respect certain people. They were taught that they are superior. You have the journalists that write the columns and that write and report stories. They report from a perspective by which they were taught in school. We could change that. And then everyone will look and be treated better and the world would be better as a result of us just making sure we um, teach better history. And who knows, after we conquer this, we'll conquer the Bible and get them not to have us looking at a white Jesus. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> they say his hair was made of wool. Right. Wool. Is this kinky, right? Right. Nasty. His 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 skin was a bronze. Bronze is golden. Bronze is baked. Bronze is of color. Hello, don't let and, me and get started. At least, Ray, that's where we could get the history taught right in those books. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. I appreciate you guys' time and All implement right. me. Thank you guys. It's Thank very you. nice meeting everybody too. Thank you. Malika, you're gonna close us yeah. out. Yes, yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lisa Ray. Thank you to the panel. Let's see who's still here. We still have Dino, Heman, Vanessa. Uh, Erica, of course, is still with us. Um, I see NBC Chicago has been listening. Um, I think that's it for the panel. The rest of the panel is, has headed out. Thank you so much to the viewers that have stuck with us and everybody watching Facebook Live. Please get involved, get involved. This is a very important movement. Again, it's to stop the miseducation. It's to stop feeding into systemic racism that our history books have been feeding for ages. And like he said, I'm, I, when I look at a Derek Chauvin putting his knee on George Floyd's neck, that's proof of what was fed into Derek Chauvin that he felt he could do that, do that so easily. It's, it's what he was fed about us, that we were less than human. 
And so that ends now. I think this is the start. This will start to chip away at systemic racism, most definitely. So thank you all so much for your time. And um, you all have my email address and we will continue this conversation and take an action September 15th. We work backwards from September 15th to work on that piece of legislation and get it done. And we are about getting it done here. <laughs> We're about getting it done. We already got a bill on the table that's going into, into session. This will be our second one. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. All right. Thank all right. you. All right, guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too. Okay. Have a good one. Bye-bye.